The sitting is resumed, and it's time now for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And we will start with listed questions. I can advise members that questions 2, 5, and 10 have been withdrawn, and I call Ms. Claire Hanna. Bigger question one. Thank you. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the Northern Ireland Law Commission ceased operations in 2015 before it had completed its review of the law of defamation in Northern Ireland. We were able to secure the services of Dr Andrew Scott, who had been undertaking the review on behalf of the Commission. However, that break in the handling arrangements has inevitably impacted on the overall timetable, as has the additional work that Dr Scott has undertaken as a follow-up to the Commission's consultation. We are, however, hopeful that Dr Scott's final report will be submitted to the Department by the end of this month. I call Claire Hanna for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his answers. I appreciate that there were the delays uh, with the Commission and so on, but I think uh, this reform is clearly in the public interest and indeed uh, a survey uh, of, of people with a specific interest in this field found that overwhelmingly plus 90 per cent thought that the law should have been reformed. Can the Minister uh, outline the reasons why uh, the law wasn't changed through legislative consent motion in 2012 when it was changed across the, the Water, and if there were any reasons why the then uh, finance and personnel the minister members asked her to block her that. Thank you, Minister. Well, obviously, there are differing accounts about how the 2013 <coughs> Act is, is handled. And I believe that it was appropriately handled by the Department, but I don't think that there is anything to be gained by going over the old ground. The important thing is that Northern Ireland will have had the benefit of a thorough and independent review in relation to this, because I'm looking forward to, or my predecessor is looking forward to not only having the report, but actually seeing how Dr Scott's recommendations can be dealt with in uh, due process. The, the issue of, uh, and has been asked by a number of members uh, in, in other ways, will this report uh, be laid before the Assembly? Uh, and the laying process was triggered by the Law Commission sending a copy of its report to the Department of Justice. If the Commission is no longer in existence, that trigger will unfortunately no longer occur. Moving on, I call Paul Gibbon. Question number three, Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for his question. The Financial Transaction Capital or FTC can only be used for loans to or equity uh, investment in a private sector entity. Therefore, it cannot be accessed directly by councils. However, uh, it is possible for councils to work with private sector bodies to utilise FTC. All financial transaction capital allocations require a sponsoring department. Therefore, any organisation wishing to explore the use of FTC should contact the relevant department, or alternatively, the Strategic Investment Board will be able to assist. Once the Northern Ireland Investment Fund is operational, there will be a separate process for engagement on accessing its funding. I call Paul Gibbon. Can I thank the Finance Minister for that response? He will be familiar with a scheme in my own constituency of the Knockmore Sprucefield Link Road. Would that be the type of scheme that this uh, fund could access and councils and the Department for Regional Development engaging with the private sector to unlock the huge potential that exists within that part of the constituency? And how does the investment fund. The member plan? has asked this question, Minister. And well, I was almost about to ask the question. <laughs> uh, well, I thank the member, and I can uh, anticipate what it is he was going to ask in relation to, uh, in, in regards to the investment fund. Let, let me answer the, the issue in regards to uh, the, the council and the very particular issue that the member raises, and it is a, a concern that has been raised across a number of local authorities. The, there has been a number of engagements actually with councils on uh, FTC funding, including the possibility of the ARC 21 project availing of FTC. And so the issue that the particular project that the minister, uh, that the member, maybe that was uh, saying things are going to happen in the future, uh, is referring to, is, is in that category of projects that we think 
uh, should be seriously considered. The previous Finance Minister, uh, Simon Hamilton, met with Solus uh, Group on this very issue back in March uh, some time ago. And in addition to this, the issue of FTC was raised by Council officials in a recent meeting with DFP officials on the investment plan uh, for Europe. So, in regards to the investment fund, I think that the fund would be available for the executive to deploy available financial transaction capital, and I think that those two elements brought together should give a financial package which gives local authorities some certainty that there are other streams of finance that will be open to them. I call Martin Amelier. Uh, I'll ask him, Corley. I wonder, could I ask the Minister as well, does he think it's a, a good use of FTC capital, the, the use that we have seen in the universities, and if that is something that we can focus on in the time ahead? I'm thinking in particular of also University, of course, and Queen's University with its new law centre and student centre. Yeah, I, I think it is, and, and obviously, given the executive's commitment to ensuring that we enhance uh, the facilities that we have for our education, uh, providers, and that's not only in, re in relation to capital in our schools, but also in our further and higher education colleges and in our universities. And if we look at the uh, the amount of money that is available in terms of FTC, the executive will receive uh, 113 million of FTC capital uh, next year, compared to 129 million available was available in 2015-16. And obviously, the level of financial transaction capital available to the executive will decline over the spending review period, with uh, some 54 million available in 2021. So, while uh, there is many demands on the FTC uh, pot of money, I still think that every opportunity should be taken to utilise what is a valuable resource, a valuable financial tool that has been given to us, and I look forward, my predecessor, to ensuring that we maximise the benefits to Northern Ireland uh, and the project that the member has referred to. I call Fergal McKinney. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, in, in two recent, reasonably recent presentations to two separate committees, the Enterprise Committee was told that there is uh, a reasonable expertise within Invest and I in accessing FTC, while the Health Committee was told that it is notoriously difficult, despite the fact that they have set aside £10 million uh, for spend. Can the Minister tell us how we can achieve best practice among civil servants in terms of accessing such funding? Well, I think the member raises a valid point in terms of how, right across the piece, we ensure that the system and the, the various departments are working with the same objective in view. And uh, obviously, the FTC capital uh, is ring fenced by Treasury, and it must be used to provide loan or equity investment to, to private sector uh, entities. However, as I've said uh, in response to the original question by the member, that if there is uh, another, a third party that can be utilised, then I believe that that will open up the opportunity to maximise that particular amount of money. I'm certainly keen to ensure that departments continue to work together, not only on this issue, but across the piece, so that whether it is uh, this particular funding, whether it is other schemes that we have introduced over the lifetime of this mandate, that the bottom line for me as Finance Minister is that we utilise and maximise the total amount of money that is available uh, to Northern Ireland PLC, and those funds are used to the best of whether it's the Department of Health, whether it's the Department of uh, Transport, or wh whatever the department is, because the position that none of us want to be in is that money available to us is not spent in the best possible way. I call Alistair Patterson. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister thus far for his responses. The budget anticipates some 55 million financial transaction capital being available in 2016-17 for the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. Will this figure be increased by the year end, carry forward, and is it clear the fund can be used for economic development projects? Well, I think what we want to do is we want to ensure that we can increase uh, the amount of money that is available, although I did indicate uh, in terms of the overall profile of the, the amount of money that we will receive uh, in terms of 
uh, this year uh, £113 million of FTC uh, compared to £129 million, which was available in 15-16. And so there is certainly going to be uh, a particular pressure that is, is always the case in, in relation to the financial structures that we have and in terms of whether or not this money can be used for uh, the purposes that the member has indicated. I want to see this money utilised in the best possible way across a wide range of services so that we, as I have said to the, the member previously, that we maximise and utilise this financial resource to the benefit of Northern Ireland PLC. Moving on, I call Alton McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Number four. Thank the member for his question. And as required under the Dormant Bank and Building Society Accounts Act 2008, my department will now direct the Big Lottery to develop a strategic plan for the utilisation of the fund in Northern Ireland. The strategic plan will be laid before the Assembly and will include details of how the fund will operate, including criteria for accessing the fund. The Community Finance Fund will provide a unique and innovative uh, funding opportunity for social investment in Northern Ireland. Uh, it will help to improve access to finance for a range of organisations across the third sector, such as social enterprise, uh, church and smaller community-based groups. The third sector plays a vital role in Northern Ireland, but its development and growth has been constrained by a lack of affordable finance. This fund will enable such organisations to make further investment in their activities, grow their organisations and become self-sustaining through the availability of, of finance. Access to this financial support will help to increase the revenue and resources and I trust enhance the level of social benefit that they deliver to their communities. I call Alden McGuinness for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much uh, Mr Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for his detailed reply. Uh, and it is an exciting opportunity I think for uh, those in the third sector, uh, particularly social and, and church groups. Um, could I ask the Minister, in relation to uh, the issue of criteria, would there be an opportunity for assistance be given to encourage uh, recipients or beneficiaries uh, to establish themselves as mutuals or indeed as cooperatives? Uh, thank you, Member, for his question. It's an interesting concept, and obviously one of one of the the, the, the purposes that, that we want to achieve in terms of, of this fund, uh, and, and this has caused uh, some discussion, because in most cases some of these funds are all on the basis of grants. Uh, we've tried to say that as an incentive and as as a way of getting that balance right, so that we encourage long-term sustainability of groups that we would have a mixture or a combination of grants and loans. Where that would take a particular organisation and how it would develop over a period of time I think is something that needs to be given thought and consideration to. Obviously we are in the stages of going out uh, to appoint a third party who would deliver this fund. And, uh, I want to ensure that we have given the maximum opportunity to a wide variety of organisations, some who feel that the current access to uh, funding streams is uh, too bureaucratic, it is prohibitive, it, it, it creates for them some difficulties. But the member does raise a valid point on which I will give more consideration to as we try to progress this. And I know members will want to know, as I have already had numerous correspondence even to my own constituency office in relation to this, when is the fund going to be up and operational? Uh, and I trust that that will be uh, near the end, well, September, October time of, of this year. I call Dackie Mackay. Uh, the Minister has already touched on the fact that there are potential barriers uh, in this process. Could, could I ask him how he, he, he intends to ensure that those small community organisations, those micro community groups uh, in rural constituencies like our own, how he will ensure that they will be able to, to access this funding uh, and it will not only be the organisations who are good at filling out these application forms for such funding? 
You know, I think that uh, that all goes down to the way in which we establish it, the way that we structure it, the way that we have it operational, because you can either make a fund simple and straightforward, or you can make it bureaucratic and challenging. I want to have it as the former, not as the latter. And as I said in, in answer to the original question, uh, we have uh, obviously directed the big lottery to develop the strategic plan for the utilisation of the fund in Northern Ireland. And that strategic plan uh, will be laid before the Assembly. And I, th I trust that that will give some a sense of assurance, particularly when we see the detail of how the fund will operate, including the criteria for accessing the fund. And I have made it clear what, that I want to see established in relation to this is criteria that are simple, criteria that gives us what it is we're desiring to have. And those community groups and organisations that the member refers to in a rural setting and in urban settings as well. So it's not just uh, an urban issue uh, and a rural issue, it's right across the piece that they have confidence that it is a process which is fit for purpose and makes it streamlined so that they can access these funds to benefit their communities. I call Gordon Don. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for his answers. I think the issue has fairly well been covered in relation to community groups. Uh, and I'm sure the Minister is very much aware of the interest there is throughout Northern Ireland in relation to this fund. And can the Minister uh, identify how the ease of access will increase the ability of such groups in getting this funding and to do things that other funds would not be available to do? Well, well I think it, it really is, in a sense, I've answered that in terms of, of uh, to the previous member, and it will all come down to the way in which we establish the criteria. It will also come down to the way in which the third party that will be established to, to run this particular fund uh, does it in a way that has as, has as its focus the delivery of uh, the fund. It, it is a frustration for many organisations, uh, and I know well from the organisations that I work with in my own constituency how challenging the funding regime can be. Uh, and there have been various organisations that have been established that help and assist uh, organisations to access funding. I want this to become a fund that the, uh, the community has confidence in. Uh, let's remember this is £7 million, over £7 million. I think Northern Ireland has become the beneficiary of this as a result of the legislation that was uh, passed in the House of Commons. And I want to now see progress being made. I want to see the uh, fund being opened. And at, at all costs, I want to see organisations, particularly those that have felt maybe on the margins of some of the funding regimes, uh, at the centre as to how they become the beneficiaries. I call Danny Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, uh, 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 I want to thank the Minister for his, his answers thus far. Um, Clearly, this fund uh, could also be beneficial to, to church groups um, who do not uh, avail of lottery funding. I can I ask the Minister, will there be any prior priority criteria for such faith groups? Well, I, think the, and I thank the member for his uh, question, and I concur with the, the concern uh, that, that he has raised. And, and I think we all know uh, across our constituencies uh, the issue of uh, faith-based organisations that have had particular difficulties, uh, and rightly so from their perspective, of accessing and, and utilising uh, funds uh, emanating from the, the lottery. However, uh, I have been keen that as a, an element of this process and as a, a, a core component part of this particular fund, that those organisations, faith-based organisations, church organisations and smaller community groups will be able to access this in an easier way with more confidence that they will actually be the beneficiaries. Uh, it will be difficult for us uh, in terms of the actual uh, way that this will be established to give them absolute priority. Uh, however, there will be uh, in terms of the guidance, in terms of the way that we want to see this established, that focus and that emphasis and that importance given to the third party who will be successful in the delivery of the fund, that they are made aware that this is a group 
and groups which need to be given serious thought to because of the financial deficit that they feel having not had the same opportunity to access funding from their own perspective as they have in the past. Moving on, I call Paul Free. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Question number six. I thank the member for his question. This issue cannot be resolved by the Department of Finance and Personnel acting alone and will require executive consideration. I have circulated a second version of the executive paper to my colleagues. It is now for the executive to consider the issue and work together to find a clearly defined solution and budget for this particular matter. I call Paul Free for supplementary. I thank the, the finance minister for his uh, answer. Can I, ask the, why the, can I ask the minister why the issue has taken so long to resolve and if there is any legal liability to the staff affected? Well, the, the matter has been put before the executive colleagues and I hope that together we can find a way forward. This issue has required a careful thought to provide a justification for making a payment to staff where there is no legal requirement to do so. Uh, and as Finance Minister, I have a clear responsibility to be careful about the expenditure of money, particularly at a time when budgets are challenged right across all departments. I think in relation to the, the question that the member asked, uh, is there an equal pay legal liability, uh, it has been proven in court that there is no legal liability in relation to these staff. NIPSA took the legal action, as the member will be aware, on behalf of the PSNI and NIO staff seeking to have the terms of the uh, equal pay settlement applied to them. Uh, the case was lost in court on all points, so there is no legal obligation on the Northern Ireland Civil Service to make payments to these staff. However, uh, my predecessor, Minister Hamilton, put forward an executive paper on this issue because he wanted to find a way to recognise the feelings of these staff and to find a resolution, if at all possible, and if that was achievable. I call Jim Allister. It refers to a second version. I take it that's the second version of Minister Hamilton's paper which dates back almost two years to June 2014. Um, will this paper, unlike its predecessor, ever get to the executive? Or has it already been approved for inclusion or uh, for discussion? And does it include a proposal which would recompense these individuals? Well, I think you wouldn't be bringing a proposal to the executive that wasn't going to try and address the issue. And so it is a matter now for executive colleagues to make a decision in relation to this issue, and it will be an issue that will have to be determined in that way. As I've said uh, to my colleague previously, this matter has been put before the executive, and I hope that together we can find a resolution to this long-standing problem. Moving on, I call Conor Murphy. Thank the member for his uh, question. Since 2007, EU funding totalling uh, £676 million has been secured for the 2007-13 Peace 3 and Interreg uh, 5A programmes and the 2014-20 Peace uh, 4 and Interreg uh, 5A programmes for the delivery by SEUPB. The special EU programmes body is a managing authority for the EU Peace and Interreg programmes. Funding under these programmes is secured by the Northern Ireland Executive, the Irish Government, and in relation to Interreg, the Scottish Government. European funding is allocated in euros. The answer is, of course, assumed uh, that there's an exchange rate of 1.31, uh, and that obviously is always a fluctuating situation, but I trust that gives the context in terms of the question that the member asked. I call Conor Murphy for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And I'm sure he'll agree with me that, that, that almost 700 million is a remarkable amount of money that has been spent both here and in the border counties on this programme alone, not, not uh, including uh, other EU funding which is available to the executive. Uh, and it clearly has been designed to help a society coming out of conflict through the peace funding and also our, our infrastructure deficit. Can the member come to the question, areas. please? Uh, 
Will the Minister then uh, perhaps offer some suggestions as to how such funding would be achieved in the future if his own party's wishes in terms of leaving the European Union uh, come to pass in June? Well, obviously, I suppose the Treasury, given the fact that we are the net beneficiaries yeah. as being part of the United Kingdom, yeah. uh, and uh, I would not have the finances as the Finance Minister in Northern Ireland, would it not be for the way in which, as part of the United Kingdom, we become uh, a, a region which receives a substantial amount of funding from uh, Her Majesty's Treasury. Uh, however, uh, the member wants to uh, draw us into the debate around uh, what would happen post the referendum. And I have made it very clear that the debate which leads us up to and um, during the referendum needs to be on the basis of facts. It has to be on the basis of figures. And one figure that those parties who are uh, suggesting that we should uh, stay within the European Union have to deal with is the fact that we have £20 billion, pounds, which goes every year, to uh, the coffers of the European Union, an organisation which has a bloated bureaucracy, an organisation which uh, can't secure our borders, an organisation which cannot uh, resist meddling in uh, our court's decisions and I think for th that and many other reasons, let alone financial reasons, uh, there is a case that is currently being made to ensure that our money is best spent in Northern Ireland for the benefit of our fisheries, for the benefit of our farmers and for the benefit of our communities. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And given that the Secretary of State has um, said that Northern Ireland farmers will no doubt benefit from being outside the, the um, European Union. I'm not so sure it's, it's necessarily a bad thing. Um, but given the um, member previously who asked the question um, around the European funding, can the minister outline how, how much or, or give, it, give us some detail around the Peace 4 um, programme and the areas that it's targeted to? Well, obviously, the, the, the Peace 4 is an important uh, element of uh, the existing arrangements that we have. And, and let, let's be very clear about this. We will take whatever money we possibly can to maximise it for the benefit of Northern Ireland. Uh, and whatever the outcome of, of the referendum, we will still be ensuring that we will do the best for Northern Ireland. We only have to look at some of the projects which did benefit as a result of uh, previous peace uh, money, the Skino Centre uh, in East Belfast, which benefited. We had the Peace Bridge in Londonderry. We had the Space Project, the People's Park in Portadown, and we could go down a list of other projects. However, in relation to this current uh, round of funding in Peace 4, it has a total value of £206 million, uh, and it, it has also the match funding. So what we have is a programme of somewhere in the region of £400 million, which will undoubtedly, now that we have the call open in terms of the, the new peace programme, Interreg uh, for, uh, 5A has been already open for uh, almost a year. And what I want to see now is organisations right across the piece making application, applications which can stand the scrutiny and the test so that we can build upon good successful projects and we maximise, as I've said previously, this money which has come, albeit we may have an issue about more money that we would like to have in the future, but that's a debate uh, after, I believe, we know the outcome of the referendum. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for his answer. I'm not so sure about his possibly ill-founded faith and the Tories to deliver enhancements to Northern Ireland. Uh, the only precedent that we have there is that of welfare reform, and that didn't work out particularly well. But um, could I ask the Minister, has, has his uh, department carried out any audit as to the potential implications of Brexit, negative or otherwise, specifically for Northern Ireland? Um, because I think that faith in the Tories to deliver to Northern Ireland around uh, uh, post-Brexit, uh, I think, would be pretty much, as I said, ill-founded and pretty much grounded 
in a situation the, the where members asked this question. the Shires the members asked would this question. benefit much more than what Northern Minister, Ireland would. Minister. Well, obviously, uh, whatever the, the debate will be, I have repeated and I say it again, it has to be based on facts and figures. And the facts and figures, you know, I, I hear members uh, who are always asking for more information. All the information is out there that needs to be out there in terms of making a judgment and a decision. And that is uh, the, the fact that Her Majesty's Treasury, irrespective of who is the government of the day, whether it be the Conservative or the members, colleagues in the Labour Party, and we know how well they were able to spend money. They spent money that well that it bust almost uh, the Treasury. So I think that the member would do better to have a, a conversation with his colleagues in the Labour Party who got us into a financial mess that, that the, the, the Conservative Party had to try and resolve. However, uh, the issue that still needs to be resolved is for the Treasury because they will have more money which will not go to Brussels but will come to Belfast and to Ballymoney and to other parts of the United Kingdom. And now if I started that, I'll have to go around all the members' constituencies uh, to keep you all happy. But I think that it is a, a, a matter of urgency and a matter of importance. Because I do, I, I share the concerns and the fears that people have, uh, but we have to ensure that this debate is based on the facts on the figures and not on fear. And that is the end of our period for listed questions and we now move on to topical questions. The members listed for topical questions one and two have withdrawn their names. I call David Hildage. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, how much does the average household pay in taxes in Northern Ireland and how does it compare with other regions of the United Kingdom? Well, I thank the member for his question, and obviously uh, it follows on, in a sense, maybe from what the previous member was trying to, to allude to. Are we better off uh, in terms of being uh, in our, with our own devolved administration? And I think the answer to that is yes, we have tried to manage our finances in a way that when you look at the comparators, and, and this is for the household, this is for, for real households in Northern Ireland. We all talk in this House about how we deliver for our constituents. Well, in terms of the way in which you make a comparator and the average household bills in Northern Ireland, it's £1,337 in Scotland, it's £1,465 in England, it's £1,550 in Wales, and it's £840 in Northern Ireland. That is because of decisions that have been taken by this executive. That's because we and my party and our party is a party of low taxation, and we believe that that reflects the way in which we have endeavoured to protect households so that they don't have an overburdensome rate uh, <coughs> process. I call David Hillage for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for his answer. And further to that, will the Minister give a commitment that the DUP has no plans to remove industrial derating? Yes, and I repeat for the, I don't know, this is my third and uh, probably my final time as Minister of Finance in this mandate, uh, and I have to say it has been a pleasure for me to have had the opportunity to uh, fulfil the role of Finance Minister, but I repeat again, so that there is no uh, equivocation in regards to this, that uh, we have no intention of, of removing industrial derating, and during 2015-16, a total of 4,443 properties benefited from industrial derating, and as the, 30, as at the 31st of January 2016, a total of uh, 59,803,965 has been allocated to date in 2015-16. I think that, along with the small business rates relief, that, along with the empty property relief scheme, that along, along with the extension of the ATM scheme, all indicates that what we have done is business focused, is business centred, and is about ensuring that we deliver for our constituents. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Minister, uh, for his question, his answer so far. I wonder, could I ask the Minister, in terms of investment, does he recognise that uh, the Conswater Greenway has been a huge success? 
and reflects the quality of the investment in that? And would he give consideration to the Cumber Greenway as an investment that would contribute not only to the economy but indeed to the health of the people of Northern Ireland? Thank you, Member. I'm almost tempted to ask a member, as he's saying, we should all get on our bikes. <coughs> And obviously, uh, it is uh, to the credit of all that have been involved in uh, the Greenways how they have developed. And indeed, I had the opportunity just to meet recently with uh, Sustram in regards to some of these issues because I do value and I do believe that uh, they have brought uh, huge economic benefit but also huge uh, health benefits to those who have used. Uh, these greenways and in terms of their extension, in terms of their continuation, I believe that these are things that need to be given serious thought to. There has been financial assistance in regards to some of them and I think that uh, it needs to be given further thought so that we can again extend these in a way which benefits uh, communities that use them. I call Robin Newton for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for that, those very encouraging words? Can I ask the Minister, in terms of the end of this mandate and the work, I know work has already been done by a DSD Minister, would the Minister encourage this type of work, this type of project, to be part of the legacy uh, that will go into the next mandate? Yes, and I think that uh, when we look across Northern Ireland, uh, we can see many examples of projects that have made an immense contribution to the lives of our citizens. We all too often uh, focus upon the negatives, but I think that when you look across and the uh, highways are, the greenways are a, an example of that in terms of how communities have been able to uh, get out and exercise and families. Those are clear examples of what have been capital projects uh, in conjunction with community organizations, organizations such as Sustrand and others to deliver, and I believe that they should play an important role and an important part as we develop the programme for government and also as we uh, ensure that the new departments that come into existence, the Department for Communities, the Department for uh, Infrastructure, and also my own department at present in terms of the Department for Finance. I call Cahill O'Hoshin. Uh, 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 Could I ask the Minister if we would bring forward proposals for rates relief for businesses in town centres where significant public works are taking place? Well, obviously, the member will, will know that uh, we have just concluded a, a review of the rates uh, process. I think a very good uh, exchange has been held right across the piece, and I know uh, of public meetings that were held, engagements I've seen. And we're working our way at the moment through the responses to that. I am very conscious and very aware uh, of the difficulties that arise, particularly when there are uh, schemes that come into town centres. Obviously, in my previous role as Minister for the Department for Social Development, I was keenly aware that there was concerns raised by traders uh, in relation to uh, public realm works. And uh, all of this has to be given consideration. There is currently no compensation process for uh, businesses when there is a uh, process like that in the particular area. However, every effort is made to ensure that work between the contractor and the local businesses is done in such a way that minimises disruption until we ultimately get to the, the end game, which is the enhancement of our town and city centres. Uncle <laughs> My challenge in terms of being responsible for the overall responsibility of rate collection is to ensure that whatever it is we do is fair and balanced. And, and uh, we have had uh, from pigeon clubs to uh, all sorts of, uh, of other things that have been raised uh, during uh, the debates in this chamber. Everybody wants to have an exemption. Everybody wants, uh, <coughs> depending on the nature of their business, to have some relief. And I can well understand that. Uh, the, the difficulty and the challenge that, that faces us is that when you have an exemption, 
is where you then uh, collect that other amount of resource because we want to be able to improve our public services. We want to be able to improve the way in which we spend money in relation to delivering in our health service, delivering in uh, our infrastructure. So it is a point that is well made and it is an issue that will be given consideration during uh, now that we have the, the formal consultation process completed and I trust that that work of looking at the responses will give that issue and many others serious thought and consideration. I call Trevor Lum. Yes, thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, could I perhaps ask the Minister the question that was actually listed at number 12 in the main list around the impact of any removal of the rates exemption on charity shops? Make it easy for you, Minister. Well, I thank the member for his question and uh, obviously as he's aware, as I've alluded to, the review of the non-domestic rating system uh, is, is now uh, complete and, and we're looking, going through the uh, consultations. The treatment of charity shops was an issue that various business organisations, district councils and many others commented on during the related consultation. In fact, I have had uh, a couple of meetings in relation to this and I am well aware of the sensitivities that there are in relation to this issue. And what I've said is that there will be no change to the current situation in this mandate. It will be for a new executive to determine uh, what will be the outcome in relation to that issue as well as also to the issue that I referred to that was raised <coughs> by the previous member. It, it is, and I, I want to emphasise this, it is a sensitive issue, but I would be uh, on faithful to some of the comments that were made in the consultation if I didn't say that some of the local businesses have raised, and I have some in my own constituency who do raise an issue that says, well, uh, why is that particular organisation or those organisations, even though they carry out an immense job and they do a very good job in relation to the particular charity, why should they be exempt whenever I have to pay, in most cases, either full rates or maybe uh, some of the rate release schemes that we have alluded to. So it's on the radar. It's an issue that I've already spoken to a number uh, at a meeting with NICVA and representatives from uh, the charity organisations just last week. And uh, it is an issue that I'm well aware of and will be dealt with in the sensitivity that I believe it deserves. I call Trevor Lund for supplement. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his very complete answer. Um, without wishing to preempt the outcome of the review, would, would he agree with me that, in, in given the present state of our city centre retail areas, that the charity shops actually perform a very useful service, even perhaps just by being there, and that uh, the, the outlook and the, the, the appearance of our city centres would be much less reduced if they weren't there, if they had to close because of being raided? I think that there's no doubt uh, I, along with the Deputy Minister and uh, when I was Minister in DSD, met the then Finance Minister and collectively we had a discussion and I think those discussions need to continue because we are facing a challenge on the High Street. Now we have seen some good news in terms of uh, what has been happening here in our capital city in terms of occupancy and I think some of that is, is a positive sign. However, I am well aware from my own constituency the challenges that uh, a town like Ballymoney faces uh, when uh, you have a family business who decides to retire and they may for a variety of reasons not be able to find someone to take on that business. And so any closure of any retail properties on our high street is to be regretted. However, I go back to the point that we need to ensure that, for example, the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, would that money be better spent in a different way? Those are the questions that we need to find answers to. And that's what I'm committed to endeavouring and doing over uh, the time that I'm here, is making sure that whatever the end result is, that it's fair and it doesn't in any way hinder the progress in our town centres and city centres, but actually adds value to it and encourages more investment and brings about a vibrancy in our town centres and city centres, which I believe we all want to see. I call Karen McEvitt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I thank the Minister and say that I think he's done a great job in the short term that he has, has uh, taken up the role on his last question time. Uh, uh, but, 
But <laughs> following recent elevations in Tanama, uh, will he now make a recommendation to the incoming finance minister in, in the Irish government uh, to establish an independent inquiry into the NAMA sale of the Northern Ireland portfolio? Well, obviously, and I think, uh, I think my colleague has said if we knew who the next finance minister was going to be in, in relation to uh, the. Uh, Yes, we would maybe then be in a better position to know who it is we are going to have those discussions with. I think that it is a, an issue of sensitivity. It is an issue that needs to be dealt with in a way which is uh, proper. And uh, I have ensured that, as far as we are concerned, that uh, everything is done in a way which is proper. Everything is done in a way which is right because that is my responsibility as Finance Minister and I am quite happy to ensure that whether it is me or any other subsequent Finance Minister that we are there for one purpose and for one purpose only and that is to manage the finances of Northern Ireland in the best possible way and to ensure that we maximise the best opportunities for Northern Ireland. What others do and what others have done is for the process and for the system and for everybody to find out how that either wasn't done correctly or wasn't done in a way which gave confidence to the community and the people of Northern Ireland. And that is the end of our questions to the Minister for Finance and Personnel.